Good evening and welcome to our 6.30 Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we pray God's blessings upon you and we uh, give God praise and glory for your presence tonight. Uh, we thank you for tuning in with us. We know that you have a multitude of options when it comes to your online Bible study experience. And that's why we always, always want to make sure that we pause and say thank you for joining in with us for Bible study. We are making our journey through 2 Corinthians, and tonight we will be in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. And I thank the Lord for the fact that we have been able to go on uh, this journey looking at 2 Corinthians as Paul has done a wonderful job in trying to help the church grow into uh, this, this wonderful place that God can use to help develop Christians into a better uh, mode of what God will use them for. We have journeyed through 1 Corinthians and, of course, 2 Corinthians and chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And tonight, chapter 7 will be a journey we'll take also together. Let me uh, now pause and allow us to center ourselves Allow us to go to God in prayer so we can begin our Bible study properly. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this night. We thank you, God, for blessing us so immensely. We thank you, Lord, for this day, God, for this, this new month that we are in. We give you praise and, and glory, God, for what you have done, and we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity. Bless us now, God, is our prayer. In your Son, Jesus, the Christ's name, amen. All right, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. And again, verses 1 through 16, we have some questions that will help guide us through this process. And so I want to uh, jump into these questions after we read 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. Now, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Whatever Bible you have with you will be great to also follow along with us in it. Let us now begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and of spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for if for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I often boast about you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with consolation. I am overjoyed in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way disputes without and fears within. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did not, I'm sorry, though I did regret it, for I see that I grieved you with that letter, though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance, for you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves guiltless in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who was wrong, but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God. 
In this we find comfort. In addition to our own consolation, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his mind has been set at rest by all of you. For if I have been somewhat boastful about you to him, I was not disgraced, but just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting to Titus was proved true as well. And his heart goes out all the more to you as he remembers the obedience of all of you and how you welcomed him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. May the Lord bless the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. All right, we're in 2 Corinthians. Let me give just a brief uh, recap of where we have been in 1 Corinthians. First, understand this. We read this as a book in the Bible, which was originally a letter. You know, Paul went out and he established these churches in different cities. He did this under the direction and with the approval of God. He went out to establish churches in places like Corinth, in places like Philippi, in places like Thessalonica. He did this as he was going and establishing churches, allowing God's people to experience this uh, wonderful thing of the good news, and even in some instances, to convert those who were not of the household of faith to believe in God as their savior. What Paul was doing was going around and establishing churches. He also set up a system whereby every church, if they had concerns or questions, they could communicate with him, and he would respond back with letters. Now, in some instances, Paul discovered that there was something going wrong in the church, and he also wrote a letter to help the people adjust to that. What we're reading in 2 Corinthians is part of just that. Paul wrote them a letter before 2 Corinthians called 1 Corinthians. And he was admonishing them to uh, stop doing certain things. He was urging them to take on more of this, this image of God. If you recall in 1 Corinthians, Paul kept driving home this emphasis that God's wisdom was higher than ours, that God's intellect was higher than ours. What Paul also emphasized was that if anybody in the church was engaged in activity that was not consistent with God's will, the people should not allow that behavior to continue. Paul said a little bit of yeast will leaven the whole lump. Paul also talked about the fact that we should observe each other's gifts and graces as part of a whole. Well, what happened was when he sent this letter, some folks took offense. And so Paul was having to write a second letter, emphasizing to them the need for us to continue to grow in God's goodness and in his favor. And so verse, I'm sorry, chapter 7 is part of that second letter. So we jumped in there, and we want to jump in now with some questions. Remember now, every time that we gather, it is my hope that we learn something more about the character of God, the human condition, or the particular text that we are reading. So let's jump into tonight's Bible study with these questions. First question I want to ask is this. According to Paul, how do we perfect our holiness? So Paul believes, as I do also, that we can be holy. Now, we can be holy, which means that we can pull ourselves away from certain activities, to set ourselves apart from certain behaviors, and if need be, set ourselves apart from certain people who are engaged in those behaviors. That's part of what it means to be holy. Holy is not looking over somebody and lording ourselves over them and saying, I'm better than you. Being holy is not walking around very piously with our nose in the air and our, and our chins up and declaring how holy we are. No, holy is about trying our very best to avoid doing some stuff that's inconsistent with God's will. Holiness also involves that if we find ourselves doing something wrong, we repent of our actions 
and try to get back on the path that God has for us. That's all a part of being holy. So Paul asked the question, how do we perfect our holiness? How do we make it better? You and I should be more holy in 2022 than we were in 2021. We should be more holy in 2021 than we were in 2020. And as it goes and goes and goes. In other words, we should try to be better than we were yesterday. So look at what Paul says. Paul says, since we have these promises, well, what promises is he talking about? He's referring to the promises found in chapter number 6, right? About how God will be with us and about how God can use us, right? And how God has shaped us, right? And about how uh, the weapons of our righteousness and, and our warfare, right, uh, are, 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 are good things, right? Paul talks about this. Paul says that God has commended us in every way through great endurance and affliction, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, right? And the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in honor and dishonor. Paul's talking about these promises that we have and he says, listen, since we have these promises, beloved, chapter 7, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. This is a perfect scripture for tonight. As part of our liturgical year, we observe this as Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday kicks off our Lenten season. Ash Wednesday starts the process by which we will engage in trying for 40 days and 40 nights to draw closer to God. So in Lenten season, what we oftentimes do is we take on something or we give up something. Oftentimes it is a fast to give up some food or give up some activities. It's also bringing on something, more prayer. And as you know, our objective this first week is to take on more reading of God's scripture, right? So this is a perfect opportunity because in fasting, we literally try to handcuff our flesh, try to chain up our flesh, try to, try to allow our spirit to grow stronger. So Paul says we can perfect our holiness by cleansing ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. It's not just enough for us to clean ourselves up of defilement of our body, right? Because I can say, listen, I don't go and do certain things. I don't uh, hang out with friends anymore. Yeah, but what are my thoughts? Are your thoughts pure? Are your thoughts healthy? Are your thoughts toward others for their benefit and for their blessings? When you see people, are you thinking, I wish God would bless them? When you see people, are you thinking, I wish God would help them? When you see people, are you thinking, I wish God would, would remove burdens from their life? Or are you thinking other things? See, Paul says we've got to remove the defilement of our body and spirit. Because in doing that, we make our holiness perfect. So Paul references this letter that he wrote. He says, them, make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. Right? And he's not trying to condemn them, as he said, but he's trying to say, listen, I boast about you a lot. But I understand also that the letter I wrote you may have actually had some benefit. Let's look at question number two. Can anything good come from grief? Can anything good come from grief? Paul asked a very important question. Let's look at what verse number 10 says. Verse 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. That's important to note. Well, what is godly grief? Godly grief is when maybe a family member 
or a friend, a true friend, says to you, hey, I don't think that the path that you're going on is best for you. Or the actions you took yesterday, I don't think they're consistent with what God has for you in your life. When we hear that, they're not condemning us. They're trying to be our conscience. And for those who watch service on Sunday, if you recall, I preached about the fact that when we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, we can become a conscience for other people. Again, not lording over them that we're better than them, but simply saying, let me be your conscience. Maybe when you're thinking about doing some things, you need someone to say, hey, let me help you in that area. Let me cheerlead you to go in the right direction. Hey, let me support you. Let me encourage you to keep doing the right thing. We all could use a cheerleader. We all could use a godly conscience. We already have it in the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we need to have it also close to us in people. So Paul says this, listen, godly grief can lead to repentance that does what? That leads to salvation. Repentance is good. Repentance is us acknowledging that the direction I'm going in right here is the wrong one. Let me turn from that direction and go in the right direction. That's what repentance is. Repentance is acknowledging that we're going in the wrong direction and we should turn around from that direction and go in the right direction. But notice something. If I'm going in this direction and nobody says anything to me to let me know this is the wrong direction, but just let me keep on walking, that's not a true friend. A true friend grabs you by the shoulder and says, hey, this is not the right decision for you. I know you. I know you want better for your life than this. Come on and go in the right direction. That's a true friend that says, go in this direction, this is the right direction. And they're not basing it on how they feel, they're basing it on the word of God. To say, hey, listen, I know you're trying to do some right things, don't go down that path. That's a true friend, all right? And we should all strive to, number one, be a true friend, and then also surround ourselves with true friends. I want friends who are gonna correct me. I want friends who are going to say, Harold, love, that's not right. I want friends who care enough about me to say, listen, you need to do this instead of going this direction. Don't you want true friends? Don't you want some folks who care enough about you to say to you, that's not right? Don't you want some friends who will surround you with love and concern and enough care to say, hey, I see what you're doing. I don't think that's right. Don't you want some friends? Or do you want some friends that just check a box that says, yes, you're always right? You don't want those kind of friends. Those kind of friends are unhealthy for you, all right? So Paul says that we have to learn to uh, be true friends and give sometimes godly grief because godly grief leads to repentance. Now notice the difference he shows here where he says, but worldly grief produces death, and that's true. You can grieve something that takes you down a spiral. You can grieve maybe the loss of position and then it leads to envy and jealousy and then strife. You can grieve the loss of opportunity to do what you want to do and then find yourself pursuing because you want to do it. How many times do people say, well, I'm just going to do it because I want to. I know it's wrong, but I want to do it and, and then find themselves in a death spiral of sin. So Paul says, don't have worldly grief, have godly grief. Allow someone to be your chili, allow someone to set you on the right path. All right, last question. Paul says, how can we show concern for those who have been hurt? See, the Bible gives us prescriptions for anything in life that ails us. Oftentimes, people are hurt, and we may not know how to show concern for those who are hurt. But look at what verse number 12 says. Paul says, so although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who was wrong, but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God. In this we find comfort. So there may be situations in your life where you're stuck in the middle. One friend 
did something to another friend. And you're stuck in the middle. And each friend wants you to mediate which one was right. Paul's taking the position of saying, listen, I'm coming here. Now, I'm not coming because they hurt you. And I'm not coming because you got hurt. I'm coming so you will know that I'm concerned about your situation and I want you to be better. That's a true friend who says, I'm here because I'm concerned about you. I'm here because I want you to be better. I'm here because I want you to grow. I'm here because I want you to succeed in life. I'm here because I want you to realize all the promises of God in your life. I'm here because I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is, is inside of you and that your body and your spirit are, are, the, are the temple of, of God. I'm here because I want you to actualize your full potential. I am here because I want to know that somebody cares about you. That's what Paul is trying to teach us, to be there for somebody, to be there for others, to be there in their most difficult time to help them see the possibilities that God has in store for them. Paul's letters are trying to teach us how to be that perfect and complete disciple of God. And if we pursue the course he lays out for us, we will be that. If we pursue that, we will find ourselves able to accomplish a great many things and able to overcome a lot of things in life that hold us back. And so Paul encourages us to do this and make the right decisions. Listen, if, if you are desiring to be better in your journey in life, there's just a few steps in here that Paul lays out for us. If you're desiring to elevate your uh, service to God, Paul says you can start by doing what? Removing every defilement of body and spirit. Now, you may not be able to do it all in one month, but at least you ought to grow daily. Take these 40 days to strengthen yourself. Take these 40 days to constrain your flesh and allow your spirit to grow. And I guarantee you, you will be better for it and those who you love will be better for it as well. As always, I invite you to join us for our prayer call on tomorrow and for church school on Saturday. I also want to encourage you uh, this is uh, our first Sunday coming up. So I want to encourage you also to come by and to pick up your communion between 10 and 12 noon on Saturday so that we can collectively uh, commune together. Now, I want to encourage you also to know this. We will be coming back for in-person worship very soon. While we are in process of that, let me ask you to please email copies of your vaccination card. That will allow us to, for our members, to go ahead and have your vaccination card on file so that when you come through the doors of the church and we're looking to see if you have your vaccination card, if you may have left it at home, we can look in our records and say, yes, we have a copy of your card here, scan you for your temperature, and let you come on in with your mask on. So, We'll be giving information out very soon of our dates for reentry, but we will be back in our service in person uh, in this month. But we need you to comply again with those uh, requirements. Email us your vaccination card, all right? Until next time, it is my prayer that God bless you and God keep you. Stay safe out there. Continue to walk in the direction God has for you. Be blessed.